evening good evening good evening good people welcome 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 give y'all a second to get in and get settled hopefully everybody know the zoom rules by now make sure you stay on mute uh, we're gonna make sure there's a chance for open community conversation uh towards the end but um for the first part of this we're asking y'all to come in and and get muted and get comfortable and sit back and relax and enjoy the, the conversation this ain't no performance we all all the brothers here uh do this work for a living but this conversation is for fun just call some brothers out say i've been listening to this work and it's impacting me and moving me and i'm having my own individual experience with being um the, the influence of this 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 his work kendrick lamar's album on me and my life and my work as a therapist, as a counselor, as a community worker, as a, a convener of space for black men. And I just knew that there was other brothers out here doing this work that I feel like we're having similar and different experiences with this album. So I just called them, you know, brothers that I've worked with before, brothers that I admire, brothers that I respect. They, they grind, they hustle, they, they healing, they hardness and they softness. This brother has been watching for a long time. So, um, they all said, yeah, man. Everybody was like, yeah, let's do this. Um, and nobody said, what's the honorarium? Ain't nobody said, who's sponsoring? No, nah, let's just do it. Let's just chop it up, spend a little time getting to know each other, uh, processing this together as a collective. And um, here we are, man. I appreciate y'all also for coming out, uh, the community, for y'all to gather. I, I know this is an album that impacted a lot of people. So um, appreciate y'all for coming through and spending y'all, what's this, Thursday evening. I'm here in Chicago. It's nice. It's sunny outside. So, I, you know, we, we could all be in a lot of different places, but to come together to decide to spend some time putting our minds, hearts and together and, and, and spirits together to elevate each other using art and culture and, you know, focusing on black men, you know what I mean? Like something that everybody don't don't value in that same way. So for those of you that are here, I appreciate you. Um, we can get right into it. Um, if y'all don't mind, the conversation is going to be recorded. Everybody could not be here at this time. Some people sent me DMs talking about, I want to see it, but I can't be there. So uh, this will be recorded. Um, so if y'all want the link, I'll probably put it on YouTube or something a little bit later. But just in case some things happen and some, some, some uh, reflections are shared here that are meaningful to other people, we want to make sure that we're using this technology for it's great, it's good. So that is the only reason we're recording it. But again, you know, this is just... Uh, five black men chopping it up, you know what I mean? Um, ain't, no, no, ain't, ain't no more fancy or agendas than that. We just want to connect and build and share and learn from each other. So it's very, very simple yet. Uh, the album, uh, Kendrick Lamar, um, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers came out a couple of weeks ago. I'm assuming most of y'all have been listening to it, uh, been you know playing it on repeat. I, sometimes it's the only thing I want to hear during the day, it's, 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 it meets a niche, uh, uh, scratches the itch. They're like, hey, nothing else is, in a long time has, has been able to uh, do for me. So I'm um, really excited about hearing how other how other brothers are processing it. I mean, sisters too, y'all, you know, I, I got a couple DMs too saying, I'm a woman, but can I come? I ain't gonna say nothing. You know, y'all welcome to speak. Y'all, we ain't finna silence no women. You ain't no, gonna see that on my, on my platform. Uh, women can come, but be quiet. That ain't gonna happen. So y'all welcome to come. Y'all insight is critical to this too. Um, he's talked a lot about his experiences with women too. Um, we very clearly know about the power of women and the influence of women and the, 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 our role as men to help um, be more in alignment uh, with our sisters, uh, particularly in a time when there's so much division. So I'm glad that y'all here. Y'all welcome to be a part of this conversation as well. Uh, let's go around and do, um, I'm gonna do quick, two two round tables uh just a quick uh, introductions um where you at uh just a little bit about your work where you, uh, um and just your overall general impressions of the album and i'll start I'll just i'll just model this and then the second time we go around for everybody um i want us to point to one or two of your favorite parts of the album a line a verse a song um, something that was particularly impactful for you about this album so we're just going to do those two questions um, in, in, in a round table. Um, I'll start again. My name's uh, Dr. Obari Cartman. I'm here in Chicago. Um, a, a community psychologist. I do a lot of work around uh, creating space for black men using man, uh, using culture, using drums, using hip hop. Um, 
president of the Chicago Association of Black Psychologists. So it's a organization that um, has influenced me a lot to help me think about psychology in a way that's for us, by us, uh, African-centered, culture-based. So a lot of my work is centered around that. I'm also a father of two boys and um, an uncle and a son. And, you know, a lot of my work is much more personal than professional. So that's why I appreciated this this, this work that Kendrick Lamar is doing. Um, and I would just say quickly, my general impressions about it was, you know, I was, very, I, was I was floored immediately. I was immediately impressed with the the diversity of thought and idea and feelings that were inspired. This is the first time I listened to a, some music in a long time that made me literally cry, like real tears. Um, and the song for me that got me was uh, it was towards the end, um, the, uh, uh, the so mother mother eye sober cried just in the car and i knew i knew it touched me so good i was listening to it for the first time while i was going somewhere so like the directions were interrupting the lyrics and it still got through me like i, I couldn't even hear all the words he was saying but it, it was it was the tone it was the, the, the narrative like i was just crying like, i don't even know what line it was that hit me in that way but like i was just driving just crying right and you know i do my best crying in the car anyway I, you know i, I know we, we own this movement where we talk about men are more emotional. We need to be, be crying. I got a shirt to say men crying anywhere and right now. And I know we can't cry all the time everywhere. Right. My 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 message ain't just because you're at work and somebody hurt your feelings, you start crying in front of your boss. You can't be at school, somebody make fun of your shoes and start crying. But I'm a big fan of crying in the car, right? <laughs> when you get home, hold it. Just hold it a little bit till you get to the crib, to the closet, let it let it loose. You know what I'm saying? It's a cathartic and cleansing. Um, but that song did it for me. Um so it was that. It was that. I, I was really, I was really touched and moved, and uh, I, I really get into like the the conversations about art. So I read all the critiques, I read the blogs, the think pieces, and a lot of what people were saying was that, you know, uh, they were saying he's obviously flawed. He's a work in progress. That there's, you know, lots of things that people were upset about uh, from the addition of having Kodak Black on there, the, the use of the F word as a slur for the uh, homosexuals, the use of the uh, B and N words, the aggression and the vulgarness of it. Um, I didn't experience none of that in a critical way. The way I read the, uh, the, the the music was very much like how I experienced men's circles when we just like, let's just talk. Just like, don't don't try to clean it up. Don't try to say the right thing. You know, we we were we were processed it together, um, but like I, I've, I always wonder who is on the other end of an article saying he's a work in progress. Like who is not, who's not still developing, right? Who's not? Who are these perfect people looking at other people saying he still got work to do? You know what I mean? Um, I, I see that as ev as everybody's story. And some people are more honest about it. Uh, the people that are, are critiquing other people's flaws are usually the people that have not accepted their own, or certainly not being courageous enough to put it out. To millions of people, millions of people to digest and understand, um, but I felt very, very much like we had just came from a circle, and this brother was just, you know, spitting his, his truth. Um, I appreciated the unpolishedness of it. He's very clearly got a bunch of people in his life that could have edited it and made it clean and had the right people and made sure that he didn't get in trouble. But I felt like he was very intentional about like just saying, "This is where I'm at as a man." and like it or lo like it or love it, this is it. You know what I mean? Um, so I appreciated that. About it. my first, that was my first impression about it. That it felt very raw and honest and authentic in a way that um, if we say we want men to talk, we can't ask men to talk and then tell them you're talking wrong. And so I appreciated that for that. I appreciated just just it, it was very deliberately unpolished in a way that was very touching to me. Um, so we gonna, you know, I just want to hear y'all impressions. How did y'all feel when y'all first heard it? What was that? What was it like for you? Um, and then we come back around and specifically look at some some lines, some um, some verses, some songs from the album. Um, I'm gonna go to my right with our brother Quentin from uh, out of New York. All right, great greetings, everyone. Um, Quentin Walcott out of New York City. All my friends and family call me Q. So feel free to do the same. Um, I'm an executive director of an organization in New York called uh, Connect, and we do um, pre uh, violence prevention work. And I, and I kind of entry point into violence prevention is intimate partner violence. And then we look at like domestic violence and um, really engaging uh, communities around how to transform communities from, you know, struggle with violence in many capacities into sectional violence and really transforming them to a uh, 
uh, a community of peace. And one of the ways we do that is by engaging men and boys uh, to be part of that uh, part of that work and be real honest about the fact that uh, we commit most of the violence. You know, that's a, it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. And, you know, and I say that not to negate the fact that men are harmed as well and uh, that we're harming each other more than anybody else in terms of men, um, in terms of, uh, you know, men and women. So that's just something we have to look at and be honest about. Um, so that's what kind of like the work looks like in, in, in essence. But I do a lot of work with men and boys. And thank you, uh, Dr. Vari, for inviting me to this. And I know you and I have been uh, connecting on, online for a long time and admiring of each other's work. So um, like I mentioned, I'm in New York City, so you're going to hear fire trucks all the time. So I apologize for that. But um, yeah, man, I, I became a real fan of Kendrick from this album more than anything else. And, and like the things that you mentioned was uh, Dr. Bari was that, you know, he came as he was, or came as he is. And, you know, that, that work in progress piece is, is cliche, but it, I think it's real. I think I'm a work in progress, you know, and I, and I think I learned so much from his album and, and the way he said it, right? And like, I work with young people and young men, and we always say, you know, you can curse, you can say these words within context, you know what I'm saying? So they say it within context. Sometimes they go a little bit too far with that, but uh, we want to give them, you know, the, the space to be who they are and say things the way they, they see it right now. Of course, you want to impose your will on them to kind of see the world slightly differently. But, um, you know, what, what I liked about this was that in a track that I, that I, that I liked the most was um, Father Time. And only because I thought that that was like the, uh, the foundation for the rest of the albums and the rest of the conversations um, in the album. Um, but what I liked about it was that, you know, Kevin Powell, I don't know if you read his piece in Complex Magazine, he talked, he said that, um, that uh, Kendrick Lamar was being, has decided to be free by any means necessary, right? That's Brother Kevin Powell. And um, but what I loved about this 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 piece in that track and all the whole track, the whole uh, album, it was hard for me to kind of pull a quote or one particular track. But I thought this one like was the precursor for everything else, and I felt that he was being um, he was being vulnerable, but looking at vulnerability as a as a form of accountability and a form of strength. So that that's how it kind of it kind of landed for me that he was uh, you know being straight up honest. In, in, in dealing with all, you know, um, all the issues that he's experienced over life. And I think it's, it's coming up for him now in a, in a way that's either through maturity or through time or further harm being done to him in his business, his music business or whatever it may be, but it's coming up for him in a way that I think he sees it a little bit more critically or, um, or is in a place where he sees these issues and, um, it has a little bit more understanding around it. So I think that is uh, what he's expressing. And again, he's not perfect. He can, you know, he can, he can change some language and things of that nature, but we get the essence of what he's saying. And as we all do work with men, we gotta meet them where they are right now in this moment. And I think he's just revealing and unearthing things that a lot of men experience, but may not have the language for it or the space to really talk about it. Good, good, good. Very much. Appreciate you, brother. Um, brother Bobby, you next to him for me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Obari, brother, I appreciate the the invite and the opportunity to connect the rest of you, brothers. I'm 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 always willing and eager um to connect with brothers in this work all over. Um, not just in my home of Baltimore, but across the nation. You know, make this make our community a little bit smaller. Um. But I'm Bobby Marvin Holmes. I'm a social worker working with children, youth, and families in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, you know, primarily working with black boys, um, holding space for black boys and black men in therapy, um, as well as uh, their family, uh, the family unit, um, providing uh, youth development programming uh, through, through my, uh, my agency, Son of a Dream Services and Multimedia Resources. 
Um, so for me, for this album, um, I'm, I'm with Brother Q, you know, Father Time got me, you know, just in terms of in our work, right? You know, for the rest of the world, they they pay attention to the what. You know, he acting out in class. Oh, he on a corner cussing and carrying on. Um, but in our work is in the helping tradition and the black helping tradition, we have unique experience of exploring the why, why things are occurring that way. You know, we don't have the luxury of just stopping at the what. We have to know why um, this behavior occurred because something led to what we're seeing on a corner, something led to what we're seeing in the classroom. And in our work, brothers, we have the unique opportunity, the privilege, the honor um, to have an intimate look at how it came to be. You know, the that for that kid out there with the hoodie on and the pants down or whatever have you, um, we get to hear his intimate thoughts and feelings. Um, something that most won't and people judge him on solely his behavior. So with this particular piece, Father Time, um, I believe that Kendrick gave that type of insight, you know, um, just, just showing how uh, hyper-masculinity is formed, showing how we get to uh, point A to point B, you know, how we get to um, a, a, a black man showing his bravado, um, sometimes in a very aggressive and hostile way um, to the other men um, and to women in his community. Um, and we look at it as a society today, especially a society that we live in today that we're, we're hypersensitive to these things and we're, we're very aware and cognizant of it, like, I, I guess, like never before. Um, but what he did, he showed you how it happened. This is a matter of socialization. Um, there's positive and negative socialization and how you're socialized um, to be hyper uh, masculine um, in our society and how that's reinforced when you step outside of the home. It's reinforced in your community. It's reinforced in your peer group. Um, his story, Kendrick's story, is my story. You know, it's the story of so many other brothers um, that I grew up with, that I love, um, that I call friend, you know, it's my uncle, it's my male cousins of how we were so orientated into manhood, good, bad, or indifferent, um, and how we were socialized to be based on our environment, you know, starting from family to community. Um, and I believe he gave, um, a, a play by play uh, so to speak of how it happened. If we're doing some Monday morning quarterback and we rewinding the tape, he rewind the tape for us and say, okay, this is how this forms. And I mean, this is how our black boys um, become, uh, a lot of our black boys become who they are and how they adopt these, beha these behaviors and these traits and these habits. Um, you socialize to do so. Again, good, bad, and different. Um, but um, it was uh, fa Father Time that really got me for sure. True, true, true. Um, brother, uh, Doc Kurt, where you at? Dear my brother, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, you good. We can hear you. Okay, all right. I'm Dr. Curtis D. Jasper. Uh, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm actually born and raised in Chicago. Uh, although I've been in Atlanta uh, for, for a little over 20 years. Uh, professionally, I serve, similar to Dr. Obari, as a community and social psychologist, uh, mostly focusing on Black males. Um, I am in private practice, but I do a lot of lecturing and consulting work and work with entrepreneurs. Um, but this is actually my second career. I started off initially as a classroom teacher in Chicago Public Schools. And then I brought the talents down here as an administrator in Fulton County Schools. And somewhere around uh, before I hit 40, I decided that I'd take my own show on the road and sort of uh, provide a, a, a synthesis of uh, education and psychology. Uh, I'm a father of four. I'm a grandfather um, as well. And uh, uh, I was actually pretty overwhelmed by the album. You know, uh, 
and I was excited to be overwhelmed, right? At 51, I had been there, done that, a lot of different areas, uh, and some areas more, <laughs> more than a couple of times. But I found the album to be for Kendrick, and I know he's not. Uh, I don't think he's 40, um, but at 51, it resonated with me on a lot of different levels, and I, I found myself appreciating that. Right? I've had this discussion with my peers and some of my colleagues, but I haven't taken the discussion to the young people whom I'm fortunate and blessed to serve because I hadn't absorbed it for. So I didn't want to come in without really spending time with the album. And I'm still in the process of doing that. Uh, but overall, I, I felt uh, that it was all encompassing and I was overwhelmed, but in a good way. I didn't think anything need to change. I'm still experiencing it. I don't actually have a judgment. The only superficial judgment I have is some of the beats. Right, but but that's just the, the old 80s hip hop head in me. Uh, but as far as the rawness, I appreciate it, right? And it resonated with me on a lot of different levels. Um, I, I do work mostly in three different areas around grief, uh, teaching about emotional intelligence and helping families navigate uh, intimate relationships. And he touched on that in a lot of different ways, right? Father Time was uh, not my favorite, although it was impactful. Um, uh, I liked a little bit of each one of them. United in Grief, obviously, uh, uh, yeah, worldwide. Sorry. Auntie Auntie was was refreshing, right? That one was refreshing, and I did not expect that. That probably was very, yeah, that one caught me, um, but in a good way. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my thing. I, I, I like the album. I'm still appreciating it. Uh, I plan to take it to uh, my young you know, some of the young partners that I work with in the community and check with them. Uh, keep in mind, brother, that I'm, I'm in Atlanta, I'm in the South, so you already know who the gentlemen I work with, you already know who they rock with. <laughs> some, of the, some of the cats they rock with, I already right. know, them, right? So I'm still learning to kind of meet them. So I'm going to have to weed this in with some of the Southern artists who they rock with and see if I can bridge this gap. I don't think it'll be a challenge, um, but I do have my eyes on two or three of them that I know uh would help me bridge the gap uh regarding this album so i'll pause for that brother i'll pause there for a minute brothers mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it remind me what big crit be doing big crit if he be on that already uh, i don't know that your boys listen to big crit but it does yeah. give you a, a, a bridge to the, the southern sound and thank you that's like, gonna be my segue appreciate yeah, you yeah, reminding me of that yeah, right yeah. <laughs> um no, i appreciate you uh, for being here uh brother and sean where you at What's up, everybody? Uh, Rashawn Miller, uh, based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I, I wear many hats, but um, a therapist uh, that I have a private practice and I also got a nonprofit that does mental health awareness in the community. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of these gentlemen um, to discuss something that I feel like is a, a important piece of culture um, because it, it gives a voice to a lot of people that don't know how to put words to certain things, right? Um, and we as men uh, are able to flow a little bit better over a beat. So this allow this gives individuals that opportunity to connect over that. Um, for me, um, similar to Dr. Kirk, man, I'm, I'm still digesting a lot of it. And I, I try to refrain from even reading reviews and all of that. I know when it first came out, man, I, first, first of all, people be ready to put a review out there going the album come out at midnight. They got a review up at 12, 10. I'd be like, yo, like what? <laughs> like, that's gonna be getting me. I'm like, nah. So like taking my time with it. Um, but then also understanding, I think us as, as clinicians, we, we understand that everyone has a, has a different perspective. And um, I didn't want my, my perspective to be tainted by somebody else's. Um, so that's why I held off on hearing reviews and, you know what I'm saying, just wanted to sit there and run through it. Uh, but then not only just run through it, but then like, I'm, a, I'm a type of person, I got to read the lyrics while I'm listening to it too. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you, you miss stuff because you, so, you get so caught up into it. Um, but then also we all learn differently. So, I mean, this, you know, it gave me an opportunity to be able to um, feed my soul in multiple ways. 
Um, and so I'm just, uh, it's a, it's an honor to just, like I said, be here with you all, but then also for us to dis discuss this and then understanding where we all can connect in certain ways. Very good. I uh, appreciate you being here, my brother. Um, one of the lyrics, I caught a lyric that I found by reading it that I couldn't, that I, I didn't hear when I was listening to it. Um, so I'm glad you made that point. Let me find that lyric. It was on. The Mother I Sober song um, is the lyric way he say. He's talking about his mother, and then he describes something that I connected with immediately, where he say, uh, watching water, live, live, live my life in nature, only thing that relieves me. Um, and we've watched his spiritual growth over albums. Well, he talked about being Christian, struggled with that a little bit. Uh, certainly raised in that I had you know Bible verses on a uh, 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 good kid Mass City, but then he kind of was going Israelite a little bit, and now he got uh, a toe hard on here. Now he could talk about Buddhism, and there was a line where he says, uh, "I look, I'm looking for God in like the trees, right?" So I, I was I was remembering that 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 idea when I read when I read this. And again, I missed it when I was listening to it, but when I read it, I saw this piece where he's saying, "I'm sitting by the water. The only thing that relieves me." My spirit guy whisper in my ear, tell me that she sees me. Right, so heavy to me. When I think about, I one of the, one of the, I study um, uh, traditional African spiritual systems, and 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 everything that I've that I've looked at so far has a connection to sort of the divine feminine presence that's connected to water, uh, Oshun by, uh, in the river and fresh waters and Yemonja in the ocean, and I, I'm picturing uh, Kendrick sitting by the water. He in L.A., so he got an ocean by him. Um, and talking to his spirit guides or listening to his spirit guides, trying to help that divine feminine presence help his mother see him, right? Such a really profound moment for me. And we talk a lot about like therapy and healing and we, you know, we got our own spaces where we're doing uh, good work, but there's still something that talking ain't gonna ever get to. Something about being in nature will always, right? There's, there's something about just silence that's better than talking sometimes. Um, so I was really, I was really struck by that as he was trying to process the things that he'd been through, um, and doing it by the, by the water. Um, the, 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 the most, my favorite lyric on the song, on the album though, I'm going to say that I really want to know what y'all think about this. It was in the father's, the father time song. Um, it was right at the end. What my man say? Let me find this. Father time. Let me share the screen so y'all can see the lyrics again. Here, you know, talking about the trauma, talking about, you know, as y'all, as all y'all have mentioned, just the honesty of going through his story coming up to denial. And I hear, I'm like, okay, I get you. You've been through trauma. You've been through a bunch of stuff. And then he ends with a call to men by saying, you know, till then, and I, I, the till then for me is like till the healing, till we reconcile, till we come to some balance, until then, Let's give the women a break. And it's a very, it's such a, 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 like he paused before he said it. And when I heard it, I just thought about how often in my life I lacked the discipline to go through my own healing process without leaning on women, without having women, you know, bear, bear the burden of my unfinished product. Um, and I really just resonated with this idea as a call to men. So it's like, I know we will be going through a lot intergenerational trauma, we still, you know what I'm saying, still st stuff's happening, but we still do that and then dump it on the women because part of our attachment to women still is, there is healing in that, but sometimes there's manipulation in that, sometimes there's uh, abuse in that, sometimes there's, uh, we, we, we use them like crutches. For me, I was using women, not even like sex, he talks a lot about sex intimacy, and we talk about that too, I wanna get to how honest he's been in this album about you know, not not smoking and not taking pills and drinking, but sex was the thing that was his yeah. addiction. Um, and for me, it was intimacy. It wasn't even sex. It was intimacy. I always craved that closeness. I always hid. I hid myself in the adoration of women in ways that caused lots of tr trouble for me. Um, but I love this call. He ends the song. Let's just give the women a break. We know women dealing with so much already, and then we add to them. We take advantage of their desire to be connected to us and we cause more more trouble in, in that. I, I love that line. That's my favorite line uh, in the song. Brother, brother Obari, man, if I can respond to that. That, that, that last piece still stood out for me as well. 
And like, uh, you know, Brother Holmes was talking about is uh, that track is like a conversation around uh, male socialization, right? right? And gender roles and the gender binary and masculinity, right? And it's, and I love the, the conversation between a, a mother and a father about their child, mm. right? The father's basically saying, you know, you need to man up. And he's saying it not just because it's about, you know, you gotta be tough, you gotta be strong for no general purpose. It's a response to the fact that we deal with racism in our society. Yeah. That you gotta be tough, you gotta be strong. And for me, my mother raised me and my brother. You know, yeah. my, my parents got divorced when we were like two and three years old. So my mother was the one that was saying, you gotta be tough, you gotta be strong. You can't cry out there. You gotta mm. be a certain way. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about necessarily part of it was navigating police in New York City, yeah. uh, you know, gang culture or whatever in New York City. But she was more concerned about getting your butt home at the end of the day, yeah. right? So do what you got to do to do that. But what it what it would raise for me in my work, as many of you all do with with young men, and we have this conversation: what is a man? What is a woman? Was that you know it's about that masculinity piece, and then also. The, the, you know, negating the strength of mothers saying, you know, it's okay to feel, it's okay to be vulnerable because that's the strength. And we always recognize how strong black women and brown women in particular are because they can be, um, they can be, they can emote mm -hmm. all the different forms of emotions, not just the, the anger and the outrage, which is okay for us. So I thought that was a really interesting conversation and that, um, uh, in some ways, he was making a decision to, to go with his father's view of, you know, getting up, standing up, moving on, opposed to what his mother was saying was feel and yes, get your butt up and continue, mm -hmm. right? That there was a, and I think, and, and because of rejecting some of that, we have a lot of issues with, you know, black, some black men have issues with women and respecting them in a certain way, because we wanted it to come from our dad no matter if they're there or not, you know. Yeah, yeah. Rashawn, you ain't gonna raise your hand. Speak freely. <laughs> I just don't, I just want to make sure I don't be cutting nobody out. That's all. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, um, no, uh, Q, man, you, you touched on a lot of great points. And then um, I wanted to tie it back into uh, what Dr. Obari even um, said as far as with that last line. Um, when it came down to challenging men to, you know, give women a break and, you know, step up to your own, to their own plate. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of the, I think, I think honestly, we could have a whole conversation about just one song. Cause this is yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. life this song too. <laughs> um, so the line says, I got daddy issues. That's on me looking for, I love you really em empathizing for my relief. Yeah. For me, man, I did a post probably about, a year and a half ago with so I got my son is three and uh when I took my son to go see my pops um you know when we were getting ready to leave my pops when we, when we were getting ready to leave my pops yelled to my son I love you hmm. I looked at him like nigga you ain't never told me that hmm. I'm 30 yeah. something years old yeah wow. yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh. I'm sorry but but I I I get it but then I didn't get it you know yeah, what I'm saying yeah yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So like even when Kendrick says that, you know, we looking for the I love you, it ain't a lot I love you from what you were saying, Dr. Bar, you know, we, we lean on women heavy and all of those things, but sometimes we're looking at it from that from that man figure in our life too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We need that type of nurturing from the men in our lives. And so that's I feel like we all serve that role in a certain aspect, but it's mm -hmm. different when it comes from your bloodline. That's right. Right. <laughs> And he openly shares that, especially when we're not always able to be able to, you know, vocalize those particular things and be able to. Those three words are some of the hardest words for niggas to say. Yeah. And we'll say that joke to a woman just to get into a draws or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. If we go be real about it, you say we can be frank about stuff. Like no, that. no, that's right. That's right. All right. Sean, go ahead. Can I ask you, did you, did you? Though you didn't hear your father say it, did you know that your father loved you? I knew it. I knew it from actions. And I, I think 
even from action, it comes from the aspect of, you know, he provides, but there was no emotional love there. Mm -hmm. I still, I still, there's a difference there, man. There's a, there's a difference from your dad coming to hug you. There's a difference from your dad. Just, it's a difference between my dad hugging me and my dad just dapping me up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yo, you know, and, and brother Keon, you know, people respond in different ways. Some people are good with the words. Some people need the action. Some people need both, you know, so it depends on how you, yeah, yeah, right, right. And my, my pops, I'm, yeah. I'm in the South. Like, I'm in North Carolina, born and raised. My dad grew up, uh, you know, raised by his granddad, you know, on a farm and all of those things. So, like, they didn't they didn't emote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. That ain't, that ain't what you're getting. You, so, you know, like, you to go to your point, though, Keon, it's like, I you know I love you because you got a roof over your head and food in your belly. Yeah, yeah. So one, of, one of the lines that uh, a few of the lines in, in Father Time that stood out for me, uh, the line that reads, "Daddy issues made me learn losses. I don't take those well. So a loser's forever. Daddy issues." Um, and so what that what that res how that resonates with me is like uh, the pain as a result of of the sore, right? The the, the, the word sore uh, and how it uh, relates to daddy issues. Uh, means that you know we carry that pain, uh, and it and it's expressed even when our fathers uh, are trying to uh, make nice, right? Mm -hmm. We know now. I'm a grandfather, so I can I can assure you there's a whole different dynamics that come when you two generations in already mm -hmm. trying to get into your own specific head, heaven and learning through experiences. Uh, there's some grace that need to be shared around. <laughs> yeah. I need to. That would be appreciated. Let me share that. Yeah. Uh, but the but the line about daddy issues hit my emotions. Never express myself, and how that sore lose uh, that uh, being a sore loser equates to it. Just the pain body that comes with. We ain't taking no losses. Yeah. Uh, no fouls on the court. No rejection from the women. Just we ain't taking no losses as a result of that huge daddy issue umbrella that's that's over most of the brothers that I that I rock with. Let's talk about that grace for a second. The the okay. redempt the re, the redemptive the, the 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 worthiness of black men to to fuck up and then try harder the next time. Right? It, it's saying that, you know cancer culture is its own thing, but. Uh, I, there was even a theme in the the video with the uh, when he morphed his faces when he had OJ when he right. walked into Jesse Smollett's right he reminded us these these were men at some point that they had they they stories they they ups and downs and we so easily dismissed them motherfuckers like we just threw them away and we as black men doing this work have to find a way to to to, to strike that balance this accountability I want you to be honest meet you where you at push you to be further but not buy into the 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 dis the the, the uh, discarding of black men who have fallen um i see a lot of people shaking their heads at him having kodak black on on, on his album he got a lot of flack for that uh mm -hmm. at what point is a kodak black redeemable what does he need to do to be welcomed back into the circle um is that a, could that be a moment of transformation for a kodak black that Kendrick Marlowe was responsible for. He certainly could have picked a lot of other rappers that were cleaner, that wouldn't have get, given him as much pushback. But like, I feel like there was a there was some deliberateness about that. Um, how do you use that idea that every man deserves second, third, fifth chances? How many chances does a man does a man deserve uh, in the context of all the things that we know are happening to black men to explain the reasons that we come we come out traumatized and do harm? I think I, let me get uh brother Bobby first. Yeah, just, just real quick. I I just think that and and that's why I like about the song, um, so much. And I I think in this cancel culture, as you as you pointed out, there is such a rush, um, to hold accountability, um, and 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 without the process of reconciliation while the process of healing, while the process of understanding. Um, and that hasn't been afforded to the black community. 
um, you know, throughout history in this country. It hasn't been afforded that that process of reconciliation, healing, um, and, and the space to be heard. And in this council culture, where on one hand, I I, I like the call for accountability mm-hmm. of men. It's needed. Yeah. However, I believe as society we're pushing the fast forward button. Um, going past the healing, going past the grace, going past mm-hmm. the understanding, and then telling black men, you need to get right. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate about this song, Father Tom, because he gave an explanation as to why. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember my father, you know, scorning me for me yoking a kid up back in eighth grade because um, he got the phone call that I yoked the kid up in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as I came in the door, he's getting on me about it. And he didn't stop to ask, well, what happened? Why did you do that? Mm-hmm. He didn't know the boy said something about me and I was being made fun of and bullied at school. He didn't know all what was going on. And he just automatically scolded me when I got through the door. And I feel like within this council culture and calling out and holding Black men accountable, there's no space to unpack, to explore why. Mm-hmm. And what he did in that song also is um, he's showing you how our humanity at a very early age is being distorted. Mm-hmm. You cannot show weakness. You cannot show pain at no point. If you're going to a, a, a part of your ham, humanity is being shut off mm-hmm. at a very mm-hmm. early age. And so when you grow up, you know, middle school, high school, you're a part of you you're not allowed to access and yeah. you're not allowed to express because it's socially forbidden. It's forbidden it within your household. It's forbidden within your community. Mm-hmm. So when we use that word grace in this council culture, I, I don't believe grace is being given to black men. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not being given. Yes, we should be held accountable but at one point, it has to be an explanation as to, well, why are you doing it this way? Yeah. It, it, instead of the rush for you to change, because, you know, we're, we're, we're clinicians. We can't have someone come through our door and say, all right, you need to get right. Mm-hmm. You need to get yourself together. In the first session, you telling somebody they need to get mm-hmm. right. You didn't give me any space to be heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. At, at, at all. Yeah. So, and, 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 and in this culture, and what I like, you are inviting men to express themselves, but you cannot tell men how to behave when they show up to express themselves yeah. because it's not acceptable acceptable to your liking. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about these flawed men, yes, they're flawed. Yes, they'd be held accountable, but we have to look at the why. Yeah. Why did this happen? Why did it turn out this? We're, we're, we're skipping years of trauma. We're yeah. skipping years of socialization just to get to accountability and say, well, hey, you need to act right. And when we're talking about learned behavior, you were, you were taught to behave this way. It mm-hmm. was modeled for you to behave this way. So as Brother Vashon was saying, like, you know, uh, about his dad and a lot of other dads, like, well, well who taught you this? When did your grandfather say, I love you? When did his grandfather say, well, who's, who was doing this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was learned behavior. It was no, 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 no textbook. No Mm -hmm. Steve Harvey specials or anything like that of how men are supposed to behave. So these men learn in a racist society, these men learn how to cope the best way they knew how. These men know how to navigate these these spaces in order to survive. So this was learned behavior. My father did what he knew, the best he knew how based on what he was taught and what he saw. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure my grandfather did the same thing. So we're, we're talking about generations of learned behavior, but we don't take the time out to unpack like Kendrick did in this one song mm-hmm. to unpack, to understand the black man. You have to take the time to understand what the black man has been through to understand what he's doing today. It's basic saying Kofa. Mm-hmm. And if we mm-hmm. don't do that, then it a lot's going to be lost. And I, mm-hmm. and I believe, um, speaking to where we are with cancel culture and with this song we, we we have some unpacking to do before we say all right well black man you need to get your shit together quick mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, all right mm-hmm. 
you gotta give me some time to finish unpacking this stuff. Yeah, get, yeah. Give me some time. You, I don't know that I'm, I'm messed up inside. Yeah, I don't yeah. know that. And, and until you give me the, some time to process and unpack that. Yeah. I love it. Listen first. I love that. The first session, you, you for the first five sessions, you just listen at first. You don't come in diagnosing, judging, treating even. Just, I just want to understand this. Um, part, of, part of what I what I reminded of when you talk about the coping, the natural or socialized trained coping comes back to what Kendra kept saying around the sex addiction. Troy, that's such a common, I've never heard a rapper talk about being addicted to sex. Um, Nick Cannon back in the news again, he got more babies coming out. He, he couldn't he couldn't hold his celibacy, right? He celebrated, build the village, all that's good. It's something about sex specifically that men go to as a, as a, as a I, I used the word crutch earlier, and maybe it's not, maybe it's healing, maybe it's empowerment, maybe something else. But the way he talked about it felt like it was a disruption to his relationship for sure. Um, I almost felt bad for his wife. She kept apologizing to her. She kept saying, go to therapy. He kept saying, I'm working on it, but he kept going back into this revolving cycle of coming back to the sex, fucking with white girls. Um, like whole, the whole thing, so many stuff. He gave us so much to talk about that, you know, some artists for dancing, some of for, for introspection. This piece was for conversation. There's so much he gave us to talk about. Um, and and I, I love that y'all thinking about doing that in y'all work. I just feel like there's so many other layers that we got to unpack that he just gifted us. And instead of critiquing them, we need to, as Bobby said, understand it, listen first, and then figure out now, now what do we do with it? It's here. Now what do we do with it? Uh, Dr. Kerr, you want to say something else earlier about the, uh, the question? Yes, sir. I was, uh, when you asked about the grace, mm -hmm. the yeah, 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 the redemption. Yeah. Uh, what I what I find as, and, and you also mentioned, uh, Doctor Obari, about do do fathers deserve it? Uh, yeah. I, I didn't. I wasn't. I don't know if my father deserved it, but I deserved for him to deserve it. Hmm. Say that. Say that again slower. Hold on. <laughs> That's I, good. I don't know. I don't know if my father deserved it, but mm -hmm. I deserved for him to deserve it. That's good. And so. I realized when my father transitioned in December 2013 in Chicago, yeah. uh, I realized that I had been grieving him my entire life. Yeah, yeah. Right. And after he passed, uh, I had to go straight into forgiveness. I realized mm -hmm. how much emotional energy I had assigned to him mm -hmm. because of his role in my narrative. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And even on his best days, he was the antagonist. Like he could, even on his best days, like grown kids of my own, on his best efforts, mm -hmm. I still had him locked into the very label and and and, and road that I did back in in, in 1979. Mm -hmm. right? September 1979, I was eight years old, uh, and so when he passed, I, I I chose for myself that I had to forgive me for not forgiving him because mm -hmm. he cost me. Yeah. The women and the promiscuity and the yeah, overcompensating, yeah, yeah, yeah. the gangster yeah. leaning on ableism, right? Yeah. Let, let, let's be clear. Like, we, you know, we would, I would college to, to have a labor, a different level to pop my shit on the streets when I get yeah. back to Chicago yeah, yeah, once, yeah. Once, once we left high school. But I say all that to say, counsel if you will, but there's a cost to counseling. Mm -hmm. there's a there's a huge cost so we may feel like we're getting paid off mm -hmm. but the cost on the back end is what's keeping us uh probably discussing this album for quite some time in my opinion oh. say more about that what's the cost what do you see as the cost for cancel for canceling like the, the 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 assignment that we give it right like when we mm -hmm. counsel somebody we have to dedicate a different uh energy perspective to them right mm -hmm. we don't just cancel them and they just go away somebody yeah. keeps that going right yeah. the counselors keep it going <laughs> yeah. yeah right but you know uh, you know on that on that note i just wanted to jump in because i think we're talking about two different things you know when we talk about and i've had conversations with men for years about accountability versus cancel canceling i think it's two different things mm -hmm. and i think um I'm like and I, I agree with the brothers around at what point do we hold brothers accountable because accountability is about is a good thing right that we're, we're hearing about ourselves we're figuring out that we did some harm we're recognizing there's consequences to that 
And that is also, we got to be in the process of change. And with that change, sometimes is some form of reparations around that or reconciliation. So I definitely agree on that. But what, I'm, what the, the point I'm trying to really make is that uh, a lot of times cancel, cancel culture is not about us as black and brown folks. That's about media. That's about white folks canceling people around race. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times, and we are the most forgiving people, not of not just of everyone, but especially of our own, right? So we have to recognize that. But we have to look at holding forgiveness and, and forgetting. That's another conversation. But like when we when we think about not holding men accountable, it's it, that's there's a cost to that. You know what I'm saying? And I know there's a rush to, yeah, let's just give brothers a break. But also we have to put this in context of, you know, women, because we're talking about women and black and brown women who have been harmed by, by systems, but of course by white folks and ourselves as well. But a lot of it, because what we do sometimes is that we jump to, uh, you know, the accountability process for, for men and making sure that we're not throwing them away. But I think there's a timing piece because we're not, you know, putting the time and energy into the hurt that women received and the healing that they need as well. Because some, because we get into this this gender uh, uh, enemy consciousness around gender, men versus women, who's more valuable? Who are we as black men going to jump jump to right away? So I think we got to look at that because it's really in the context of race versus gender. And we can hold both, right? Because the part around canceling and these ideas of accountability is under a white gaze. You know what I'm saying? Bro, say more about this, though. You say give brothers a break. That's not my position. My position isn't give Carter Black a break or myself a break. No, no, no. I'm not talking break. about Carter Black. So who, I'm talking about, like, it's, you know, so it's not, it's not yeah, let it slide. Not... It's address it. No, 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 no. I mean, like, no, no, no. What, what I'm saying is, uh, I think, no, when I say break, I'm not talking about like let anybody off the hook because yeah. that's what we're accused of all the time. Yeah. What I'm saying is that, yes, we got to look at accountability processes because mm -hmm. there's not just, I cancel, uh, you know, R. Kelly or Bill Cosby, you know, just, just like that and throw them away. Their careers are no more. What I'm saying is that we get into this thing around, particularly because of race and how, you know, black people are treated under this, uh, under race, that we we jump to black men and we negate uh, black women. And that, what I'm saying is that we're linked together, so we have to kind of do both, and not and not because black men are not getting um, they're not getting the resources to heal and transform. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you say, "I'm going to pick a side. I'm going to deal with." The black men and, and negate and minimize the black women's story. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. White. Um, I'm gonna open the floor up in a second. I'm gonna go one more round. I want to try to speak to one last question. Rashawn, we about to say something. Your mouth is open. It's like it's, yeah. You gotta. I got. Go I got one thing I wanted to touch on. Uh, no, go ahead. You got. It. You were talking about uh the whole sex addiction thing, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, a lot of us as as males, especially as black men. You know, we we uh we think with our dick a lot. This, this mm -hmm. is real. <laughs> um, but then one of the things I also had to realize for even for myself, you know, just um, you know, you get a you go through this point even as as a young boy or whatever. You get you have a fascination with your dick, and you mm -hmm. know. You want to play with it a lot, or you want to use it a lot, and all of those particular things. And then one day, I had to sit there and ask myself why. Yeah. And for me, it was more so the aspect of um, whenever I felt like I was out of control, that was the only thing that I could control. Mm. Whether that be masturbation or having sex with that was the only thing that I could control was my dick. Mm -hmm. And that's why I reverted back to it so much yeah Can oh I yeah i get that i get i mean tra like trauma feels like sexual attraction right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sexual attraction feels like trauma right and so coming up you know we did especially especially if you had access it, <laughs> and, and 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 they was choosing right right uh so that I, you the part about accountability uh, that I like to, and I, I won't be long, I promise you, is that 
there is no accountability without support, right? We forget that there's a two prong. Mm, I got you. Right, yeah. right. There, there is no support without accountability. There is no accountability without support. We want to hold brothers accountable. There has to be some support mechanisms in place. Yeah. That's real. Go ahead. Listen to everybody. Bobby, good to see you, brother. I ain't seen you for a while. So yeah, 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 yeah. So just real quick, this notion of sex addiction, because um, what I found in my work really is to look for the underlying sort of you know causes or whatever that you say. Why is this person doing this behavior? And um, and what I found a lot with men is that we're not taught intimacy mm. right? in a way that's and we're not even taught touch. You know, mm. all right. So. A lot of us don't grow up with just this healthy kind of touching or hugs or anything like that from other male or from other people. You know? So we seek this intimacy through having sex because uh, we crave intimacy, we crave touch, we crave wanting to be, you know, with something. Just, just even a massage. You know, think about what a massage does to you in terms of just speak you know, up a little bit. Bro. Speak up a little bit, brother. I hear you a little bit. Sorry, can you say? So Perfect. You can think about what a massage does for you, you yeah. know, in terms of just touch, you know, yeah. and how it heals you, you know, and that's not even sex. There's nothing yeah, sexy yeah, yeah. to it. So when you got, and also the attachment issues, where people have to think about how attachment and how it plays out. And, and I, you know, I know it's a white man's site, you know, um, theory in terms of, but you got to think about how do you, you know, relate to other people. And if you know about attachment issues in terms of, you still crave that connection with somebody, because mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about here but you cannot, you know, you cannot sustain it. So this notion of just even having sex is just you have it for the moment, you just have it, mm -hmm. but it's not really about the sex, I mean, because you get the sex in terms of the explosion, you know, the orgasm or whatever, but it's not what you underlining of what you want. Mm -hmm. you want. It's intimacy, you want a connection with people. And, and people think, you know, if you had uh, anxious attachment or, you know, insecure attachment or avoiding attachments, you're not going to stay around because you cannot manage the intimacy part of it in a way that you want it. The part of you that wants it, but you cannot sustain it because you've never, you've never been used to it. You never mm. you know what it means to be in a healthy, secure relationship with somebody. So you keep seeking it, <laughs> mm -hmm. going around and, and leaving bodies behind you, basically. Sort of thing. So I just want to do highlight about that as well as somebody else was saying about you know the sexual trauma and in terms of because people don't even talk about that in terms of you know how we introduce this i mean you know the analysis around black men you know men not even black men in terms of if you're a 13 year old and you get with a 19 year old you're the man and you know you everyone's giving you a high five and, it's, and that's abuse but what happens when you introduce the sexual energy at a young age and and not you you're not developed even as a, a young person properly yet. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Introduce it as energy. And 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 I don't know if people have these conversations about what sexual energy is as well. That's another deeper conversation. And how you use it. Um and how it can be healthy for you. It could be a healing process for you. But if you're having sex or you know, just willy nilly and just, you know, in kind of, you know, really sort of um, you know, promiscuous ways in 13, 14 year old, by the time you get to 25, 26 or whatever you know you're running around lost because yeah. you've not been able to cultivate this energy in a way that's been healing for you. it's been actually a detriment to your body you know, yeah. like and, I, I, and the communication in the community is not like that you know and so so that you know that's what we're dealing with i, think. So, I do think there's something I under there i do think that there's a, a desire for intimacy that drives sex i think there's a point though that it gets distorted um there's a point so, in cool. which it becomes domination and manipulation um, it the, the the natural intimacy that touch and like you mentioned massages and just closeness, I think that is connected to just our experience with being humans. But I think that there's so many young men, it, you know, some of the boys I'm talking to in Chicago have got disconnected from their humanness to such a degree that they're using sex in a much more animalistic kind of way. Absolutely. And so it's really just about the explosion. It's really just about the conquest. Um, and that's, I don't think that's natural. I don't think that's normal. I think that's a, 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 a byproduct of the trauma. Um, but it's hard to think about how do you correct that? Like that's a different problem to correct than to teach boys to crave intimacy, have that be okay, do it with boundaries, do it with consent, do it in the context of friendships. It ain't always gotta be romantic. So you ain't gotta lie. You gotta pretend like you love her. You can have intimate relationship with friends and have the closeness and be as fulfilled even more so than if you had the the, 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 the sexual touch like that's a different process of teaching that to humans 
than I think we have in some of these neighborhoods where we have had to undo the internalized savagery that helps have these young men feeling like they don't even deserve intimacy. They're not even fully human so that they're not even trying to connect in, in actual natural ways. Um, I think that we've been unnaturalized. I think we've been, you know, we, we've been dist distorted as beings in, su in such like fundamental ways that the sex addiction thing looks so much different depending on the kind of boy you're talking about. Um, and I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to fix that. Go ahead, Quinn. He talks about that in, in the album. Like, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. About, you know, basically, you know, having sex with white, white women. Mm, that, mm -hmm. was like, uh, that was like an intentional yeah. uh, combination, like you're talking about, you know yeah. what I mean? And I think a lot of it is connected to his mom and what, or his notions of what, you know, women are and, um, you know, that the intimacy that's, that, you know, like, that that's okay. I mean, you, you want to be hugged. You want, yeah. you want, you know, you want that, that, that intimacy in that way. Um, I think that was lacking in different parts. Um, mm -hmm. And I think he talks about it throughout the album in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's what that goes to that, that last, that last line. Sorry, Bobby, about uh, let's give, just leave basically give us some grace. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, yeah. cause they're not perfect in, you know, that, that type of thing. Yeah. Bobby. No, no, that's interesting, Brother Q. Uh, with, with that line, I was wondering when you both was going to bring it up. Um, the line he said, you know, the first time I fucked the white bitch. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at that line, you know, from what I interpreted as the, the black man seeing the white woman as a prize, you know. Mm -hmm. to, um, and, and, you know, to when you finally get it, it's, it's a trophy, it's a badge mm -hmm. of I, I finally got with a white woman. Mm -hmm. um, and as we continue to see perpetuated um as you know that being some type of crowning achievement um that's a notch on your back that you got you a white one or yeah. even redemption for your ancestors he went that far with it that's, yeah. that's yeah. the part that's i was gonna it. say he went right. that far he went i thought that. it was a good spin on it right because it wasn't the trophy right he said i don't know how i feel like the first time i fucked a white bitch mm -hmm. it resonated yeah. to me because he also he mentioned like she paid her daddy's sins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ancestors watching me fuck was retaliation. But he mm -hmm. started off saying, I don't know how I feel. Like I mm -hmm. thought it was supposed to be the thing mm -hmm. sticking it to the white man. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't because I was trying to get a trophy or acceptance. Yeah. I really was like, you pan, you, you, you know, you got to put this work in <laughs> mm -hmm. some form of uh, reparations, mm -hmm. uh, but in but in a sense, weaponizing sex yeah, weaponizing. in a different form. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask one last question. I want to, again, I want to keep you all night. Uh, and I want to give the, the floor just a little bit of chance to, to ask questions, speak. But as I, as I experience this, this album as a conversation, very raw, very unpolished, you just, this is where I'm at right now. I'm, 20 some year old black man trying to figure this world out. This is where I got, this is what I got so far. I don't want nobody to edit it. It's just what it is. How do y'all, how would you respond to him? If this is him saying this to you in a room, saying he's uh, giving these, 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 these songs as conversation. If he's saying, this is my album, this is my, my state of being. Now, can you help me therapist? Can you help me mentor? Can you help me elder? What would you respond to him? And, and and I'm saying to respond to him, but also respond to so many men that have experienced seeing themselves in this album. I started to hear more and more. I, I hear people saying, man, this is me. Like, this is, he's telling my story. He's articulating in ways that I could not. And so your response to him is a response to so many other people. Um, but what's the, what's the, what's the, you know, what do you I mean, say to him? What do you say to him? I'm gonna go to my panelists first, my brother. And then we, go, and then we open the floor. <laughs> So y'all can uh, let's 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 wrap on that. That'll be y'all closing statement. Then we will open the floor up to see if anybody else has any uh, comments or questions. We try to wrap it around eight thirty if we can. It's uh, nine thirty for y'all on the East Coast, but my kids is hungry. Um. So yeah, but what's y'all response to him? The album he said his piece. How do you respond to him? He's asking for help. He's asking for guidance. He's saying, "What is the next step in my as in my in my evolution as a man? Can you guide me towards some resolution? Some." healing some resolve he's obviously been in therapy um i would be surprised if he had a black male therapist i would be yeah. surprised right so now as black male clinicians or therapists or workers however you can say to yourself in work how do you help give him something to move him to the next level sean for me 
For yeah. me, man, my, my first thing would be uh, I would ask him where does he want to be, mm. because I can't I can't um, you know give him what he I mean well help him get somewhere where he he don't, if he don't know where he want to go. Yeah. And when it comes down to whether it be healing, you know what aspect of his healing does he want the, the journey that he wants to go on. Um, but then also what type of person does he want to be? What type of human do you want to be? Mm. Um, and then that's what, that's when you really understand, you know, what aspects or the layers that we need to address first. Yeah. Um, because I don't want to, you know, project onto him what my, uh, things will be. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's how I would start it off. Honestly. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Bobby. Um, for me, you know, I was I was thinking about that, and I, I you know, I, what come to mind is what I say, you know, sometimes when you know I'm I'm holding space for a, a young brother, and I'm like, all right, this is gonna be one of those slow walks. Mm. We just gonna take our time and bop down the street. Um, so for me, it, it the first, I don't know, five, six, seven sessions is it, is listening. We unpack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm just asking the, the, you know, hey, tell me more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell yeah. me more. Yeah. We just, it, it's like when you move into uh, a new home yeah. and you got all these different boxes around. All right, we got to unpack this stuff, take a look at it. Mm -hmm. you know, what does it mean for you? Um, um, and why, what's your connection to it? We, we got to mm -hmm. unpack, unpack mm -hmm. these boxes. So the, the, the I'll say the first few sessions, this ain't going to be a simple CBT. We want mm -hmm. to <laughs> we going it's going to be a long rock on uh, walk down this road it's going to be a bop yeah. for us us getting then we'll start to figure out that de destination yeah. later on but first we got to finish unpacking yeah that's good brother Quinn what I'll, you let you, I'll let you close out Dr. Jasper but I, I would just say you know this this album is a is a tell me what happened to you right so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. and I think um and I think like you know Brother Holmes is talking about is that this is going to be a long walk, you know, to unpack a lot of that. But you know, and I, and I just want to say that I believe in uh, accountability with compassion. Mm. So I would be compassionate with this brother, and and really, um, and and really leverage the fact that he's being vulnerable and really breaking down how he's feeling and figure out. You know, one, I think he, he's almost there. I think he's there to the point where he's being critical about like why, answering the why things are the way they are. I would go in a little bit more on that. And then like, and like Brother Miller said, like, you know, in the end, I want him to figure out, you know, where he wants to go and who he wants to be yeah. and not not impose my will on that, support him along the way, yeah. um, and, you know, open and available to him. And, and I just want to say this one last thing. Like I started this men's round table that I have tomorrow night probably about 14 years ago. And we based it on the whole Chris Brown, Rihanna situation. Mm -hmm. my, my call to the brothers was, the first question we asked was, if you had an opportunity to talk to Chris Brown, what would you say to him? So mm -hmm. I love this question, because um, it was really about the myths and the, all the stuff that was going on around, you know, who's at fault and who started it. Regardless of that, what would you say to this brother in that moment? Yeah. So I think those are the moments we got to get to around, you know, looking at accountability, counts, you know, uh, counsel, cancel coach and all those things. So I would do the same for this brother. You know, he's yeah. saying, I did these things. This is what happened to me. And this is why I think this happened and, and dig in further. Yeah. That's good. Dr. Kurt. Yeah. The only, the only statement I'd, I'd make to him would be thank you. Right? Mm -hmm. The rest of them would be, you know, subsequent questions like mm. um when the last time you've been heard to this mm. mm -hmm. who's heard you right um and and then the, my final question would be you know similar to to what i know one of the brothers either brother bobby or or brother miller uh said is uh is there more mm -hmm. is there more right second album with 20 tracks uh lost mm -hmm. stuff to, where the tracks did make the album like where i'm i'm here for it mm -hmm. um, but that's that's how i would approach it he was sitting in front of me uh, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd thank him i'd ask him um if he's been heard and listened to to this extreme uh to this degree this rawness this openness mm -hmm. this colorfulness and then i'd ask him uh 
what's next? Is there more? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I wonder if he feels heard right now. I would love to I would love to know. <laughs> right. He might feel critiqued. He might feel exposed. He might feel everything right. but heard right now. And I think, you know, you know, if you were watching the conversation, yeah, Rashawn. I think, uh, and probably my initial thing, just going back, just just thinking about how I I react to even some of my own clients. So mm -hmm. I'd be like, shit, me too. Yeah, yeah, that's right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right, right, right. real, real. real. Oh, shit. That, that was that was a question I wanted to ask the brothers, man. I know we're taught and trained not to tell our stories, man. But yeah. what I found the most effective thing in my work with young people is sharing my story as well, mm -hmm. connecting mm -hmm. with them. So sometimes I throw all that out the, mm -hmm. out, the out the window. And it's like, mm -hmm. I feel you. I had a similar situation. I know where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have my father around. Whatever, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're we're communal. That use of self. That use of self. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. No, it's, it's it's critical. Um, uh, Doc Kerr said about the next album. Whether the next album is going to reveal more. I might would encourage him to keep some of that to yourself, brother. Like there's the sacredness mm -hmm. to this process that I appreciate him sharing with us so that we can have this conversation about. But I know in my own work, I used to be much more transparent than I am now. Right. I, I in the room I'm much more, I, but I used to write all my shit. I used to put all my shit out there. And it backfired because people now using my shit against me to say, Oh, this remember when you said that? Right. Now you oh. put shit together, right? And so I think I think there's something about protecting this process that I would I would encourage them to consider. Uh, th those those unreleased tracks, keep them. Write some shit just for yourself. There's something that's really powerful about writing just for yourself, not to be consumed by nobody else, not to be sold, not to be dissected. Um, and I'm, I hope he got those those pieces too. I don't even want them. Keep them. I don't even want them. Can I, can I say that's the, that's the trap people falling into, right? Yeah. In terms of, it's important to be vulnerable to an extent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To an extent, everything is not for everything. Yeah. Everything is not for everybody. Something right. belongs right. just to you. Yeah. Some things are for us to sort out personally, yeah. um, within ourselves and about ourselves. I think we've fallen into that trap when uh, it's it's a lot of new language coming out. Mm. It's a lot of new language, and within that language, it, it transforms the culture, and we just fall blindly into it. You know. Um, I just respect when you said there's something sacred that should be kept to self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, social media. It's that social media mm -hmm. uh, mind frame, right? Yeah. I got to share the TV I show. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not. It's not okay. Yeah. It's not okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Can I just uh, speak Jane's, to you? Uh, Jane, Jane had a hand up a, little, a while ago. Let me get mm -hmm. that comment, and then I come right to you, bro. Sure. Oh, oh. can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Good evening, brothers. Um. First and foremost, I appreciate the robust conversation and dialogue around this. Um, I know the 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 album itself is so uh, overwhelmingly it has so much content that uh, an hour conversation, two hour conversation wouldn't even cut it. Right. Um, but I guess there was some points that I guess two points if if it's possible and if it's not, I, I completely understand. So, Dr. Abari, one of the things you mentioned in his album. Um, or even quoted when he described himself sort of, I, th I think, sitting by the water. Yeah. Um, was that it? Did I catch that correctly? Yeah, that's it. Um, and so I guess one of the things that made me think about, um, and I think you talked about like African practices and just like traditions and things of that nature, um, and an author that I read, uh, Sabon Fu Somme, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that she talks about is um, like African teachings of relationships and the spirit of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And in one of her chapters, she talked about this access to femininity, this ritual, um, the importance of rituals, and that um, males, uh, male identified folks have these rituals um, that uh, causes or is specific to accessing femininity. And, fe and female identified rituals within the tribes have these rituals um, specific to ask accessing masculinity. And so I guess I'm, that's one part I'm kind of curious about to hear from you all, um, like as clinicians, as fellow clinicians, when you're working with Klein or you're working with someone like Kendrick, right, or maybe just aspects of his album that you felt like was a ritual um, that connected, that, that was a ritual specific to connecting with femininity. That's one question. I'll ask the second one just to, and you can all choose which one you want to answer. 
The second one is more so about the Auntie Diaries. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's such a robust track. Yeah. Um, and I wish I would have heard um, more conversation that included our Black queer folks mm -hmm. um, within our community, because sometimes, right, and I'm guilty of it, we can be guilty of having very such a dichotomous conversation um, that operates in a binary. And I think that converse, that that track in itself was so chock full of information um, that I would love to kind of hear your thoughts um, on that, anyone's thoughts are, are around that. So those are my two two pieces. Mm -hmm. I'll, speak really quick to the, I'll, I'll quickly speak to the first question around the, um, the gender binary. Um, and it's, it's interesting that you you present the male female dichotomy and then use the sexual orientation as a sort of more fluid kind of thing. But I see the gender binary is much more fluid than um, even being more emotional, tapping into a female identified ritual. Uh, I think it's important for us to make all of these things very human processes so that I'm not tapping into my feminine side when I cry. I'm tapping into my human side when I cry, so that I don't have to go outside of myself to be emotional, that is just who we are, it's who we be as people. Um, I think it's important that like, all of the ways in which we have learned these gender role dichotomies, um, that I like to play around with those, I like to disrupt those boundaries. I'm a very nurturing father, and I don't feel like I'm less of a man because of it. I'm very affectionate, I'm very sensitive. Uh, I'm, I'm, I claim my softness in a way that is not, a, 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 a disregard to my my strength, um, and I think that when we when we put those things on on female things, so I have to be softer to be more nurturing to be more like a woman, then there's a, a bridge that I got to cross. Um, so I like to bring, burn those bridges down. I got a lot more work to do around some of the LGBTQ trans queer identity kind of stuff. Um, I, I did not, you know. It was not important to me, and I'll say it out loud, it wasn't important to me to have on this panel a queer identified man to help us unpack the, the those dynamics in, in, in this work. I did want us, to, us as a sort of cis hetero, you know what I'm saying, male identified clinicians to talk about Auntie Diaries. I wanted us to talk about that um, from our perspective in a similar way that he did, in a, in a similar way that I think it was got, got, got a lot of critique. I saw a lot of critique from the way he used the, the, the word faggot a bunch of times. He misidentified some of his family members um, that he didn't do it right. But I, I love that he did it, even in the way that it was, again, unpolished. He could have got some academics to edit it and, and make it cleaner so he wouldn't have gotten no feedback, but he put it out just as it was. So I want us to have that conversation. I'm glad you asked that question. I do. I do. I was very much impacted by that song. Um, I love that it was personal. I love that it wasn't academic or theoretical. Like I love he was just telling a story about his family. Um, and I think those kinds of things are really important for us to help reshift, reshape our perspectives on, on all the stuff. Um, but I, I love the moment we're in. I love that we just throwing it all up and, and, and picking it up, picking apart and wrestling with it. I don't want to lose the traditions. I think there's a, a fine line between making shit up as you go along and not been based on the thousands of years that we've been humans and learning things that do work and do have some value. Um, but I don't know. I think it's a great question. I think it's a, a, a tough moment to have these conversations without trying not to get in trouble. But, you know, I would love to hear other perspectives around just how you and the, how you heard. I just want to clarify. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. When I mentioned masculinity and femininity, in a sense, it's not that it's assigned to a specific gender, but just right recognizing it more kind of on a spectrum, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I, I do think it's okay to name femininity and to name masculinity. I think what we're seeing in this work um, or what we're seeing with a lot of black men is the anti-femininity that exists um, within how we understand ourselves as men um, mm -hmm. or even how we, you know, how we come to be as men or how we arrive at manhood and things of that nature. So I, I, you know, I, I just wanted to clarify that in a sense where it's not this. No, I heard, I heard what you're saying. Name, kind of name femininity, name masculinity. But when we do it, there's either unspoken or very, very much spoken associations with those namings. Um, and it's hard to it's hard to just ignore them. It's hard to ignore hard, soft, logic, emotion, uh, 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 aggressive, nurturing. Um, and I think that we we name them, but we also ascribe roles to them. And I think that those there's, there's ways that those things don't serve us. 
And just a quick word on this in terms of if we center ourselves as African centered, yeah, then this conversation is just kind of removed. Um, I think what we are struggling with is being Eurocentric for such a long time and having to reframe that in a way that it, because these this this is what we do, we place the dichotomy. Mm-hmm. You know what what it is. But once you're African centered, you know it's a systemic thing. So it's nothing to do about what you separate. Everything is part of the whole. Yeah. And when I just want to answer to your first question, I think something here about clinical philosophy or style, because when we speak about this album, I see a lot of promise. I see a lot of joy. Mm. I see a lot of um, growth. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of, you know, possibilities. And that I feel like sometimes I don't know how people work. It's just that we work in a way that feels like let's focus on the problem saturated stories rather than what you're actually doing so well, because there's so much wisdom in this album. So if yeah. any young person was coming in and expressing as much as this person did, or even their own sort of way, I'd be like, yo, there's so much here to work with. Yeah. But what is it that works in your life? And what is kind of like, you know, makes you feel, you know, more empowered, more, in, you know, uh, viable to work and live day to day and not be like, you know, oh, uh, your story in terms of what's venting. Okay, how what's, let me hear your story, but in a way that how does it help you in the present and the future? All right. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you stay in the past. I'm saying stuck in the past and everything. So when I listen to this, I don't. I want. And when I listen to the album and, and, and absorb it, I was like, yo, this guy's a, he's grown. Yeah, 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 yeah. Grown yeah. in such a way that's like yo, and and expressing it, and he has the ability to express it with you. Yeah. Even this conversation, this Auntie Diaries, mm-hmm. he's not gonna get it right. And I think that's mm-hmm. what's happened now in this time climate. Mm-hmm. It's not something that he's experienced. It's not something he knows about. He's not going to be up on all the verbiage or whatever in terms of mm-hmm. how people express it. Mm-hmm. So he's going to be right. But I think what we're in, and we're in a climate, if you get it wrong, people crucify him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't open up an environment or a climate where people feel safe enough to ask questions. It makes it easier to not say nothing at all. Should, you get crucified, you be like, no, nah, I'm just not even going to touch it. I'm not even going to enter the, the conversation. And I think so that's you're saying that. Kendrick was criticized by not saying the right gender. I'm yeah, he was, yeah he was criticized yeah. for not saying that. And I'm saying he could yeah. receive that and by, by regretting saying something about it at all. Mm-hmm. He said oh. it's, it's easier to avoid the confrontation to just by not even dealing with the topic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? I think that keeps us stuck. I think that's why we stay still by being afraid to even do it, to do it wrong. Right. And then right. with compassion, be corrected or be you know, have someone suggest, well, oh, this is another way, you know, maybe you could have considered this the next time you do it. But the crucifixion, that that part is such a dangerous part of this culture we in right now. Excuse uh, me, any I other know. other brothers had a comment to the, the gender question yeah. or the anti diaries? I'm going to, we're about to wrap up uh, r- real soon too. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean, my, my fault, brother, my, my, my fault. So no, go ahead, Bobby. Yeah. You got it, Bobby. Um, uh, no, that, that anti diaries, again, it was an explanation. Mm-hmm. The, the Kendrick told you from his childhood. Yeah. Like the, the, the brothers from Compton. Okay. Right, they, they, right, right. You know, and, and with respect to everybody in their humanity and, the, and, and what they choose to be identified as and called, mm-hmm. we have to understand that that wasn't the coach in the 1980s. Right. That was no the way of, of, of that wasn't the, the, the train of thought in the 1980s, the 90s. <clears throat> And the communities that a lot of us, not just black, across the board, uh, uh, that wasn't the coach that was. Hold on, real quick, brother Rashawn got to tap out. Yeah, I had an eight thirty. Uh, you, you got any final words you want to say, real quick? Appreciate your time. Appreciate you being here. Uh, no, man, yeah, I just appreciate everybody just tapping in um, and definitely just um, hearing everybody's perspective. Uh, sorry, I've been in the office since uh, like <laughs> Please, please go home. <laughs> you ain't got no, please yeah. go home. You ain't got I no. I appreciate it, man. You'll push back from us. <laughs> All right. All right, we're we, we going to wrap up soon, too. Let's do about 10 more minutes. Uh, I got I to gotta get out of here, too. So about 10 more minutes, Brother Bobby, you can finish. Uh, thank, thank you for, for being here, Brother Vachon. No, but um, definitely just, you know, it, it was an explanation because folks was quick to criticize you know, and you missed the part. It was growth in the song. He went from mm-hmm. saying F word, F word, F word yeah. to he corrected himself yeah. and said F word later on in the song. That yeah. was growth. He was telling you about how he was socialized and his understanding of things as a youth. Yeah. As a, as a, as a boy yeah. who did not know. Right. 
and how he still was able to show love, affection, appreciation, because he understood that's my cousin, that's my yeah, aunt. Yeah, yeah. I, I grew up with them. I love them. They are me and I am them. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he was conveying that throughout the song. And I and it's unfortunate because I believe if you're criticizing him for using that word, you 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 miss the point of the song. You miss mm -hmm. his evolution. Um, because hey, it, his evolution in that song was mine. Mm -hmm. And based on my understanding of transphobia, homophobia, and how I was from a little boy to I am as a man, mm -hmm. you missed growth in the song. Because mm -hmm. um, it, it was one of the most impactful and powerful songs, very surprising and refreshing, mm -hmm. um, but most impactful songs on the album when we're talking about accountability, <clears throat> um, when we're talking about support and the need for support, and, so, and, and the two going hand in hand. Mm -hmm, in order mm -hmm. to grow and get better and to come to a different understanding yeah. in the context of religions to spirit spirituality and community at large yeah. very powerful song very, very right. Right. i'll just say real quickly you know in that, in that in that last piece auntie diaries he's talking about i understand now i understand now he kept repeating that and i just think about when i heard that song i was like yeah i remember i used to use the f word i had no idea what it meant Mm -hmm. I would say F word, F word, and I would give people what I thought was an F you, give them my, my, my pinky, because I had no idea what those mm -hmm. things meant at that time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think part of it, too, is like, you know, uh, to Gene's question also, and I think you were saying the same things, like, is I do this exercise, and I, I know Gene has seen it as well, where, you know, you attribute uh, masculinity or hyper-toxic masculinities and feminine and femininity as part of this spectrum of of uh, masculinities, and now we put on a mask or this form of masculinity, depending on where we are safe, where we are in in danger, where we're being uh, defensive. So there's a, there's a range of masculinities mm -hmm. that I think it's important that we we do talk about, uh, not just femininity or hypertoxic masculinity. There's so much in the middle that mm -hmm. we kind of. We, we kind of hover over and through through the course of the day, right? If we're safe, if I'm gonna, uh, uh, if police are the guards in my school, I'm gonna put a, a different mask on. If I'm safe at home and there's no violence, I'm gonna put a different mask on. Um, but one last thing I wanted to say was a self plug. I got a Father's Day pledge coming up on, um, in Brooklyn, in New York on the 16th. And then I have a virtual one a uh, national one online on the 18th, the day before Father's Day. So please look me up, look for my social media. I would love to invite all of you all to be part of that. Father's Day Pledge Against Violence. Definitely there for the virtual one, for sure. I wish I could be there at the Brooklyn one, too. I love Brooklyn. Right, right, yeah, I right. appreciate that, man. Uh, Dr. Ballander, you got some uh, closing words for us? We're going to wrap up in, in a minute. Hey there. Um, and, and, and thank you. You know, um, I just wanted to really affirm what you were saying. And I think that because it's important for us to- It's nice to hear a woman's voice right now. You're the first woman that came on. This is refreshing. Really? Well, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My brother's got an expression for welcoming me to, to your conversation. I, I do appreciate that. And, um, but I just want to say, I think it's so important for us to remember the fullness of our humanity hmm. and um, that it's, it's while we, while we occupy bodies that have a certain gender, there, there's the fullness of our humanity and therefore a spectrum of which that fullness of humanity can be displayed. And the, the difficulty that, um, I think really that of course has is, is been uh, the bane of our existence here in this culture is the fact that because we were removed from, um, from our home from Africa. And, um, and, and I tell you that I heard this, this quote that so struck me and never left me in the remake of, of uh, Roots, the overseer said, you can't buy a slave you got to make a slave. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Is you strip them of their identity. You strip them of their culture, their name, their language, their connection to that which defines them. 
and you say, this is who you are. Mm. This is your name. This is your language. This is what you're able to do. This is where you can go. So all, all of that is removed and you are told who you are in order to be made into a commodity. And then that is for somebody else's profit, power, and pleasure. And so that is even in the context of defining what is masculine, the compartmentalization of what's masculine and the compartmentalization of what's feminine, as opposed to recognizing the complete full humanity of a human being, which we all are. But of course, we're all told that we're not, that we're inhuman, right? That we're not human and that therefore we're expected to act at that level. And so one of the ways that that happens, of course, is by saying that a compartmentalization of the, the mental versus emotional, mm -hmm. like y'all as men don't have emotions. And I tell people, I said, okay, so if that's the case, if y'all don't have emotion and you're not ruled by emotion, please explain some of the violence that occurs just because when y'all go into a rage, mm -hmm. please explain that to me. So it's just, they're, 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 they're it's it's important that we see through the lie, through the illusions of other people's efforts to uh, to identify us and to control our perception of our identities and our possibilities, and and we need to stop buying into that and recognize the fullness of our humanity and to demonstrate the fullness of our humanity. Uh, Dr. 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 Barry Carbon knows I just I love. Him him to death because he's such a he's he's such a calm peaceful spirit and in his warmth and in his display of humanity there's there's I never question that he is somehow less man less masculine uh in his expression of his if of his affection and what some might call his um his his softer approach as a matter of fact I try to learn from him from that because again, on my side of things, you know, I was raised by a, a, a mother, a single mother who grew up with uncles and boy cousins. So, so you know, our, our way of communicating tends to be what we can consider more male-like and that it's more direct and it's more, you know, straightforward to the point, straight, no chaser. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, I've said this to Dr. Dr. to Dr. Bari. So I try, I try to, in some ways, kind of incorporate that softer approach that he takes into my own. Because you can't have just one approach. Like you don't have just one one set of clothes clothing for you know for every occasion. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want I just want to acknowledge that. Um, uh, in terms of my brothers and acknowledge the fullness of the expression that you all engender, the fact that, as I like to say, despite everything that, that has happened, you know, y'all stand tall, you stand proud, and you say, we are still here. That's, That's why funny. I love me some Black men. That's so funny. just, <laughs> you know, I love me some brothers. So just, I just want y'all to, but just to be mindful of that compartmentalization and why it's done and what the purpose is and to recognize, to, 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 to stop compartmentalizing the fullness of your humanity and to embrace the fullness of it. That y'all have so much power. You have so much creativity. You know, you, you are the infinite potential of the creator in your own masculine bodies. Re recognize and live out your, that, that, that wonderfulness irrespective of what other people say and think, who the hell are they anyway? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's it. And that is our that is our conversation for today. That is the final word. We're going to end on that. I appreciate you, Dr. Ballandera. I appreciate you, Brother Bobby, or Dr. Kurt, Brother Quinn, Brother Rinshawn, and the rest of y'all for being here, for sticking it out, for helping us, you know, process this beautiful piece of work from brother Kendrick Lamar, uh, lots more to be said, lots more to be learned from him. So, uh, I can hope y'all continue to do that in y'all respective places. And, uh, till we meet again, I appreciate y'all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you all. Amazing brothers. And sister. <laughs> thank you, kind sir. Thank